much for doing this. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. And I know this is a little bit more of a formal way to have a conversation with you, but it's really fun to, to have the structured dialogue. Yeah, I mean, I'm always happy to have a conversation with you. So I jumped on the occasion to, as an excuse to talk to chat. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, I've got many things I want to talk to you about. Uh, many of them are, of course, pertaining to uh, the pandemic. And so it's an incredible opportunity to learn about what you've been thinking about and how you're thinking about these things. So um, let me start to take you through some of the questions that, uh, that I've put together. So here's a, here's a straight up question. Um, what aspects of your research do you think could help uh, organizations or the government solve COVID-19 related challenges? It's big. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so first and foremost, um, as a behavioral researcher, um, I don't um, pretend to be able to solve the actual disease, but we know and we've seen and as we've chatted that many behavioral interventions affect the, the course of the disease. And, and, and that's the bread and butter of what we study. Um, so how do we get people to behave in a certain way and not a different way? Um, and uh, over the course of time, I've studied various aspects of A, behavioral change and B, behavioral guidelines, um, the things that, that shape behavior, um, especially in my line of work around marketplace dynamics. So how do customers behave? How do decision makers behave? How do companies behave? Um, several things that, that come easily to mind. One of them is, is uh, harnessing the power of social norms. Um, we have recently shown in a, in a series of studies that um, if we use an intervention that uh, essentially leaks the idea that there is a certain social norm, that intervention tends to be not only powerful, but also to have a lasting effect because people continue to behave according to what is the social norm. So in our studies, we looked at using things like disposable mugs or bring uh, reusable bags to the store. But you could easily think about if we need to um, establish a norm of using masks, how can we um, create the right structure so that people would, would use masks? Um, and if we can use a structure that leaks that that is in fact the norm, um, and not just a structure that tries to simply incentivize using masks, we might have a stronger and a much more lasting uh, effect of that. Mm -hmm. um, we've also done over time research on um, establishing of automatic rules for behavior. Um, if we can get automaticity for some of the behaviors that that would, that would help um, reduce the course of this disease and mitigate some of the problematic aspects, um, then we take away the need to think about it and we take, a, we take away a lot of the potential errors that, um, that behavior might lead. Um, I've also looked at um, how people assess risk and how would you communicate um, risky prospects. And this reality has brought forth the need to weigh risks, right? Am I, what is more risky going to the grocery store or, um, having a delivery done? Um, should I let my child meet a friend? Um, we're weighing mental risks mental health risks versus physical risks. Um, we are trying to assess what is the risk to us based on our age group and uh, type of population and location and lots of other factors. Um, 
companies are trying to weigh risks of employees um, um, being more effective versus um, various risks to business goals. Um, so we see, we see this across the board, um, people having to deal with risk and uncertainty, um, which is a bit ironic because the original studies, some of the original studies on risk and uncertainty were done with medical doctors trying to assess the probability and the risk of um, disease. Um, with avian flu. Um, Asian flu. Um, the Asian disease, which is kind of, yes, um, very Trumpian these days. Um, so, by the way, the, the, mo the more politically correct recent versions of it were a, an exotic tropical disease, not an Asian um, disease. But, um, but yeah, so, so um, various research streams. We even have a more recent research stream that's under review right now about how the mere sentence structures that policymakers use to describe policies can engender or detract from the confidence listeners or readers would, would um, have in their statements. Um, so the whole aspect, the whole idea of persuasion comes into play. How do we persuade people? Um, this is no um, easy matter given how much noise there is in the media and all of the channels that reach people's ears, how can, how can we help people tell the, the, the main from the chaff? Um, trying to think about specific others. Um, I mean, in, in general, there's, there's um, some research that we've done on how to help people make decisions. Um, and these things um, could apply to whether you go and get tested. Um, and, and yeah, um, let me stop here. There's probably an, uh, there's probably some more gems out there. But those were top of mind. Yeah, that, that's a fantastic list. Um, this this list impresses me because I think much of what has preoccupied people's minds about the role that behavioral economics or behavioral science has played in helping with COVID-19 has been limited to hand washing, really. Maybe a little bit on the risk perception, but we had a false start there. We could talk about that, but... Um, so your list, uh, your list actually didn't even include that. Maybe you had the ma you had the masks piece in this, but that's a newer, more complex question. Hand washing is something that behavioral science has been tackling for years anyways, which is great. And we've got learnings that have applied to um, challenges from around the world where we've got communities that are just, just finally getting access to things like fresh water and latrines and just didn't have the science of, of hygiene the way, we, the way we have learned about it. Um, and so hand washing was something that we you know, had to go in and, and help teach along with you know, building the infrastructure. Um, and much of what people think about behavioral economics and the role that it's played has been kind of limited to that. And your list is much more expansive and showcases um, behavioral science its, its potential, the work that it has to do in, in a much better way. One of the things that I'm struggling with is there's this big chasm between those who perceive that COVID-19 presents a risk. Maybe, maybe the perception of the severity varies, but, but they accept that this is a pandemic that might or might not affect them personally, but is a material social issue. 
And then we have people who um, have a different perception of that risk or accept the risk, have an accurate view of the risk themselves or the community, but are willing to accept that. Back to your point earlier about we're learning about trade-offs in this scenario. I'd like to understand what you think about the role that behavioral science can play with those who don't think that this is a risk. Um, interventions around mask wearing um, are not necessarily as effective as they would be with the people who already perceive it's a risk. How deep can we go with shaping awareness and perception in order to help those who have this interpretation, perhaps born by resistance to the means, so that then they have a different view of the, the end and it's inhibiting their ability to maybe have a more objective evaluation of the risk because they don't like the price that they have to pay. Right, so I think you, you hit the hammer on the head in the sense that there are many reasons why people who don't, who underestimate the risk, underesti under, underestimate it, and it is somewhat self-serving in the, in the short run, which is why um, they don't get feedback that makes them correct. Um, the the uh, interesting analogy could be taken from the whole attempt at changing the attitudes towards smoking, um, which, which has still has not sufficiently happened, but has made progress. And what they found there was that if you, act, if, you, if you communicate the risks for what they are, that, that's so scary that you invoke every possible defense mechanism for whatever reason, and you don't get far. Um, I don't know if you remember, but the, the type of uh, communication that had Brooke Shields uh, say, I just wash my hair and I hate being next to people who smoke because it stinks. That is a much more subtle point that doesn't actually threaten, and so doesn't invoke the defense mechanisms as much. Um, so uh, that that hardcore opposition to accepting the risks um, has probably developed, if, if what we know from other instances applies, a whole set of defense mechanisms against, say the facts, the truth, the, the actual risk levels. Um, so there, there are many ways to go about doing that. One is to tackle the defense mechanisms directly. And that's hard and arduous work. Um, and given that people choose their information sources, that is sometimes almost hopeless. It reminds me of all my friends who complain about a certain political person on Facebook with all their friends on Facebook with the same uh, political attitude. So uh, they, they think they're making an impact, but, but not really. Um, but to, to, uh, to touch on a point I, I touched before, if we are able to shift the perceived social norm for the actual behavior, so instead of tackling the source of the resistance, focus on attaining the behavior. So we, we don't necessarily need somebody to admit that there's high risk as long as they wear a mask. So if we put certain um, procedures in place, certain policies, it could be certain, some types of incentives, it could be other types of policies um, to, to um, communicate that, that the norm now is that in, the, in this place you wear a mask and there is a social cost to not doing that. You can get people to exhibit the right behavior, which is, which is essentially what you want. And in some sense, circumvent all the barriers and the defense mechanism and stuff like that, um, but attain the social good you're looking for. Data suggests that with the behavior change, Come some dissonance, and so you could get attitude change as a subsequent 
um, benefit of changing their behavior uh, because it's very hard for somebody to explain to themselves why they wear a mask if, they, if there's a, at least no reason at all to do it. Um, and so my um, recommendation would be to attempt to change the behavior and have the attitudes follow. Yeah, one of the campaigns that I would love to test would be, um, it's very simple, just this idea of um, showing you know, a grandma trying to cross a busy street. And would, would you be willing to help grandma cross a busy street? And I mean, that, there's not many people in the world who wouldn't stop and, and help grandma cross that dangerous busy street. And then just to draw the parallel, would you be willing to wear a mask? Because you wouldn't necessarily worry about taking the risk yourself or directly but then showing that network effect, one person, two persons exposed is the same thing as that potential of that potential risk. And most of us, um, you know, even the folks who, who are drawing a parallel between this is, as a dangerous type of flu and, and we you know, accept the fact that our, our, our elderly community who are already sick or infirmed or the comorbidities, most people accept the data around that, but then, it's, it's after that that they're not willing to, uh, you know, to, to make these massive uh, social and economic sacrifices for. So if we draw the parallel there too, it's like you're the same person who would probably drop everything to help her through this dangerous situation. Why wouldn't you wear the mask? Yeah, I mean, I would make it more extreme. You, you're the person who would slow your pickup truck to let her cross safely. Like that's, that's, that's enough. But but I would, I would say that one thing to note with all these types of campaigns and interventions is that there are cultural differences. Um, so when um, this is when Johnson & Johnson was trying to, to promote some, some treatment in Mexico, um, it turns out that when they addressed the males, this is, this is for elderly people, most common. Um, the motivation was that if they actually go get treated and get better, they could be there for the economic engine of the family. But for the females, it was sort of to be there for, for, the, for the family, not the economic engine um, that, that, that was the biggest motivator that, that worked. So I think that we can probably nuance these kind of messages by, um, by the different subcultures. But it's certainly the case that um, we can, in various ways, obtain the, the required behavior um, and, and kind of not waste time trying to change attitudes first. Yeah. So I think those appeals to um, subculture, like self-identity around um, economic engine and providing for the family, um, here, you know, I wonder about, you know, you're the kind of person who would slow down or stop or, you know, for your grandmother or, or a grandmother, um, you, you're the kind of person who believes in children having, having their grandparents around, which is a very, you know, traditional um, way to build community around your family. So even if the risk is low for children, for everyone else, this is what we need to do to, to minimize the risk to that community. Yeah, I mean, I think that as we, as we learn more about this disease, we also find out that, that the risks are more complex. The risks are not just death, there are other risks involved. Um, and we have a lot of incentivized people communicating the lack of risk, which is why I, I, I think it's important to, to acknowledge that a lot of the population you might need to target isn't listening to you. But as a policymaker, can we come up with a policy that gets the behavior without trying to change risk perceptions? Yeah. Would be more effective. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, perhaps should be evaluated is 
um, of the individuals who have been attending uh, the protest. Um, if we find that um, perhaps, you know, statistically, inevitably, um, some of these individuals who have been exercising their, their, their First Amendment rights, but violating the, the public health um, uh, mandates, um, un unfortunately, some of them will get sick. And unfortunately, just based on the, the statistics of the numbers of people that are going out, um, some, some will get very sick and, and maybe some will die. And unfortunately, they might end up being a poster child on the risk side. Um, so, you know, some colleagues, this is not my research, but some colleagues have done research on the difference between making decisions based on descriptions and making decisions based on experience. And with this kind of situation, it's always going to be the decision maker who didn't die, who we're trying to influence. So uh, unless there is a very close relation that suffered and you somehow internalize this um, to a place where risk is feelings, we still might not have the right effect. Um, I think that, again, circumventing the defense mechanisms, getting the right behaviors in place um, is, is the quickest, uh, most efficient way to get change. And change is what's important. Um, there are a lot of arguments we can make pro and con. We, we study arguments, we know how to make them well. Um, I think those arguments should be, should be had at the political level so that the right policies are in place. I think that as behavioral researchers, we should empower the politicians to do the right thing. But as, as to um, obtaining mass behavioral change, I, I'd say policy is the way to do it as opposed to um, a, a, a sort of a, a, a bottoms up persuasion campaign. Mm -hmm. I would love to, to see those things work, work in tandem. I would love to, I would love a, a world where those persuasion campaigns could be effective um, that help offset the need for heavy handed policy to help instigate that buy-in because most of us have come to accept that drinking and driving is dangerous. Most of us have come to accept that seatbelts add safety to our vehicles. Ultimately, we, we, we find our way to recognizing the danger. We don't necessarily change our behavior because of it. We recognize and are having different levels of resistance acknowledgement with texting and driving. Some of us have changed. Yes, no, I completely agree. I think that over time we can get change, but I will say that it's, uh, and this is, this is not, we don't have the liberty to conduct an experiment, but um, all those campaigns without the policy of having such heavy handed fines and all those uh, negative behaviors, reinforcing the notion that, uh, that the norm should be not to do them. Um, I don't know if the information itself would have been as effective. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, the, 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 um, there are a lot of developmental aspects to the perception of risk. On average, most 18 year olds feel untouchable, right? And, and I think that there's research suggests that that relates to hormonal and brain development. Um, and so it's not clear that describing threats in, oh, so I'll, let me give an example. One of my favorite papers uh, with, with this respect 
um, was Richard Ibuck's dissertation, probably in JPSP. I think it's called when a change in the self is perceived as a change in the world. And what they show is that people who suddenly have kids now perceive the world as much more dangerous, despite all the statistics going the opposite way in the cities they live in. Um, and so the, 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 the issue is, you know, the, the drinking and driving, and you know, these problems have existed for a long time and we've had a long time to try to deal with them in many different ways. This pandemic is, the, the, the treatment is timely. So uh, it takes time to develop those bottoms up campaigns um, that, that would completely replace the need for policy. Yeah, I just, my expectations of our policy leaders at this stage of the game. I mean, Cass Sunstein has been busy for 10, 12, 15 years now on helping maintain the balance between uh, choice, extra, uh, choice architecture policy interventions and choice ac architecture interventions that help facilitate buy-in to policy. And we already know so much about reactants. If people don't agree with the means, they struggle to accept and have commonality on the ends. So I'm holding our, our public health leaders and our corporate leaders to a standard that says, we know enough that the rule of law is, is, is a heavy and wonderful tool set that we can use if, if properly aimed. But we also know enough now about behavioral science and persuasion, that those things could be used in tandem. And without it, we have these initiatives that, that by, by themselves, hey, there's a fine for this. This is obviously a serious thing. I can get a thousand dollar fine walking in the park and chatting with somebody. Clearly somebody is suggesting that this is important. There's, there's some interpretation there, but in absence of leveraging what we already know, so far, the majority of the public health communications initiatives, including government leaders, have really been very simplistic around things like hand washing and, and not leveraging the depth and breadth of talents that we have and knowledge that we have around identity, risk perception, social norm persuasion. And we can move very quickly on these. And you're right, we don't have time to experiment and validate. And I, as a person who over experiments, <laughs> Um, I'm willing to accept that we won't get these things perfect and we won't have the exact causal mechanisms, but there's certainly enough ideas on the shelf for us to raise the bar. And I think it's necessary as a way to help stem that reactance that we're seeing. And I have to respect it. People. Yeah, I mean, so when I say, when I say policy, I, I meant sophisticated policy. I want a policy that, that establishes a social norm. And I'll tell you why I think that why I'm specifically focused on the norm aspect or in the social aspect. Um, it turns out that when people deal with you know, difficult times, they tend to become more pro-social. They tend to care more about belonging, about what others think and do, about the connections. So if at normal times, we, found so, we find social norms to be a very powerful tool for behavioral change. It should be even more effective now because a lot, of, a lot of the people who normally don't actively value sociality do so now and, uh, and, and feel a greater need to belong. And if belonging means wearing a mask, then they're much more likely to do it. So, so, so I'm calling for those kind of policies, the policies that, that help establish the norm. Cool. That, yeah. Very good. Okay, that, that's great. So, um, I have another tough question. <laughs> and uh, this is on something that's near and dear to my heart. And that is the 
perception of science and the role of scientific thinking in the mainstream. And this pandemic has surfaced a lot of challenges in terms of conspiracy theories um, being shared, defended um, amongst even people who have pretty decent educations. Um, where do you think that we are at in terms of the pandemic maybe helping or maybe hurting um, scientific thinking? Um, so the pandemic exposed a lot more people to science and pseudoscience. Um, and what, what it also exposes is the biggest problem I think we're facing. And that is that people don't know how to tell what is real science and what is not real science. And, and coupled with that is that people don't understand that science is not about truth. Science about, is about the best theory we, can, we, can ha we have is the one we, we still can't reject. Um, and that means that when there's initial evidence, that is the best evidence we have until there's better evidence. And so as a person, as a customer of science, you need to, to anticipate, it's not about right or wrong per se, it's not about tr truth itself, it's about what is our best explanation this kind of at this moment. And so I think that the, the audience is usually um, exposed to very mature bodies of knowledge where if you, if you can make a statement and it, and it could be as close as what you have as to truth, right? Gravity pulls down is a statement that most people probably would accept, would accept as truth. But, but we know it's not accurate. Gravity can pull, pulls in lots of directions. Turns out that the sum of forces right now on earth here pulls you down, right? And down is a relative term. But, um, but, but what happens in a pandemic like this, and I think that this is, a, this is a very important analogy to behavioral science, is we're seeing scientific discovery at its infancy with respect to this disease. Uh, behavioral science is much more complicated than disease. Um, and so there are a lot of things we think are valid which may yet to be disproven and uh, nuanced and somebody would find a better explanation for in behavioral science because relative to the hard sciences, behavioral science is at its not infancy, but toddlery. Um, I think that there's that this pandemic um, increased the number of people who are interested in scientific thinking, but also highlights how much people don't understand how to consume scientific knowledge. Um, the, the, if policymakers want to take something and do something with it, it's probably more important to teach children from before elementary school how to consume science, how to think scientifically, um, how, to, how to ask why, and not be content with, with answers you don't understand. Um, and, and um, you know, at least in our own home, uh, there was never a question that you shouldn't ask. And every answer you got was the most honest answer we've had at that point. We've always qualified that it was at that point. Um, I don't think our education systems are quite there yet but I think it's way more important to learn how to think than specific pieces of knowledge. Yeah, I, there's some lovely sentiments in there. And I think that uh, when we look at behavioral science, so many of the 
the biases that we're familiar with can explain the resistance to scientific thinking. Things like people want certainty, people want black and white clarity, um, people are resistant to updating their beliefs with newer, in the face of newer evidence. Um, there's so many things, so many biases that, that we come loaded with that scientific thinking requires that we don't, uh, that, that we're not victim to. Yeah, I mean, I think that, again, our whole field as we know it today started from these biases, right? From, from, from observing such biases in, in updating of beliefs. Um, and just like uh, flight instructors didn't understand regression to the mean, um, doctors don't understand base rates, um, there are a lot of, of biases like that, but, but I, think, I think it goes deeper than the biases. I think that um, it is, and, and again, um, there are a lot of extenuating circumstances such as um, the more religious you are, the more you're told what kind of questions you can and cannot answer. There are a lot of very good scientists who are very religious, but they were able somehow to bridge this. Um, the, um, if you want an anecdote, someone on social media um, just um, belittled an article in science in favor of an explanation of what I would call a quack because the medical, the medic, medical companies pay science to publish this stuff. It's very easy to, to, um, to dismiss evidence we don't like, right? There's, there's a lot of these biases. We like to entertain a positive illusion, um, but that's different than, than how do we understand information that's provided to us. And whether we categorize that as an opinion, a fact, uh, a conclusion, and um, how do you understand scientific conclusion? Now, the biases you describe and some others are so deep that most of our colleagues also commit them from time to time. They're just there, it's not trivial to do. And if these people who have PhDs and have studied this and deal with this a lot, don't always get it right. I don't think that the expectation should be that the mass audience would. Right. So I think it's up to us to figure out how do we communicate, and there are people studying this, how do we communicate information, scientific information, in a way that is useful for policymakers, for people, for managers, for companies, and at the very least, it's not how we communicate it to ourselves. Absolutely. That's very much what uh, BE Works is all about as well, which is how do we use behavioral science to convey scientific principles, um, which means use of graphics, simplicity in that information, um, you know, leveraging things like identifiable victim effect as a way to, you know, help kind of drive uh, the thinking or the commitment to, to accepting and understanding an issue, how we frame risk, all of those elements are, are, are and can be and should be used by policymakers and in uh, general communication. I'm so excited by the work that Alan Alda has been doing in terms of um, embracing um, storytelling and improvisation as a way to help science, scientists learn how to communicate better. Um, he's done some uh, he's done some wonderful work on that front, and I think that those are avenues that we need to continue to pursue. And the very challenging role that our scientific communicators have in society is more important uh, than ever, and they should be a cherished member of society because not only do they need to keep up with the complexity of science and all of its ever ever evolving um, positions but also keep up with the latest thinking in terms of, you know, how to be a persuasive and clear communicator. Yeah, we've, 
in fact, in training PhD students, we've, we've now added a storytelling class, which is dedicated to how do you tell the story of your data in a way that would resonate with your audience. Um, not a skill that, that, that scientists uh, acquire in general. So there are some who have it naturally better than others, but it's certainly something as a field we should work on. They're also, like BE Works, they're also organizations and people who specialize in translation. And that's a hugely important function. Um, okay, this was all fantastic. Um, so I have another question for you. Um, what natural experiments do you see playing out before us right now? Okay, so every regulation and policy is a natural experiment. Um, the fact that they don't all happen at once and they're not exactly the same is an added bonus. Um, I am particularly interested right now in two. One is the shelter at home, which um, causes people to rethink their routine habits and behaviors um, along many different aspects. The other is the, is the corollary, which is work from home. So I'm currently actually looking at data with a company, uh, looking at employee productivity and use of productivity tools um, as a result of the work from home policy. And I can tell you that the, the initial results are, are strikingly positive. So working from home, uh, people seem to be no less and maybe even more productive. What I find fascinating is that there is a huge drop every weekend. And I find it fascinating because this is in a place where people's kids are at home all week and in the weekend. Um, they're using tools, working from home, that avail are available to them all day and in the weekend. Yet, all their activity is measured by how many Zoom meetings, how many Slack messages, how many emails, how many logins to the company tools. Um, drops by like 90% every weekend and a little bit on a holiday as well. And that's, that's immensely interesting because there is no external conditions that differ. And this is in a place where there was a shelter at home that is more extreme. So you weren't allowed to leave your house uh, further than a hundred yards away. Um, so there's nothing that changes between the weekday and the weekend, yet people slow down on the weekend. Um, so I think that's, that's immensely interesting, but also interesting is the fact that um, productivity seemed to have even increased. And you can think about it, it makes sense because a lot of these people travel um, on average an hour and a half a day. So you take an hour and a half of travel, suddenly you have an hour and a half of potential productivity. Um, th there are a lot of interesting aspects of this which are still unexplored um, and they could completely change the future of the working world if we understand them better. And, and as you mentioned, luckily we have a field experiment, a natural experiment um, that happened and we can measure it because we know exactly when a company incident work from home and when they might have ended it. That's very good. I'm, I'm also very interested in the uh, change of habits that you see individuals making for their own lives. Um, do you see some uh, good, some bad? Um, how's, that, uh, how's that looking from your point of view? Um, so that, that's um, I, I, so I share your, your fascination with the change of habits, because habits are very powerful. Um, so evidence I've seen so far are mixed. So on the one hand, 
um, people seem to be doing more productive things with their weekend um, than they normally do, but they still don't do enough of that. On the other hand, I worry about all the habits that were positive, like going to the gym, like um, going and, and, and meeting family and friends, uh, things that were habitual that we take for granted that um, will uh, show an increasing toll depending on how long this period persists. Um, and uh, formation of new habits in an uncertain environment is not easy because we need repetition and we need stability. And so far, it's not the case that people feel stability. So um, in, in cases where you see these things work well is where they, they're mixed with sociality. So people who now, instead of going to the gym, exercise with friends over Zoom, that, that can create really strong habits because there's a social reinforcement. Um, but those, those are the habits, the positive habits that I worry about. Even things as, as trivial as getting up in the morning, brushing your teeth, getting dressed, feeling good about yourself, if there's no external need for that and you don't do that, you might sink into a less than optimal mental state. So taking care of the self uh, is usually done through a, a series of habits. And um, if those are somehow tempered with because of the situation, that could lead to negative consequences. When we look back to the depression, um, for instance, um, I'm able to reflect on some of the things that my grandparents had talked about, the impact that it had and on their behaviors for the rest of their lives. Um, for instance, their approach to food, um, very, very mindful of how they spent their money, very mindful and cautious about living within their means and um, a, a general sense of, of, you know, always in the background, this idea that all hell could break loose. And using that to, um, in some ways, improve their appreciation of the, the little things in life, um, but also to kind of maybe hold back that uh, willingness to maybe be disruptive because there was this, this sense of fragility these were some of the observations that I had of my family and lessons learned and reflections of, you know, such a dramatic and traumatic event on their lives. Do you have an idea of what that might look like for the future generation or ourselves? What are those lasting changes to our beliefs and behaviors? Now that is the heaviest question you've asked so, so far. Um, so I think that, let me qualify the answer, the response with um, a big factor here is how long this period persists. Um, this is true both for the economic impact and for the individual personal impact. I think that, that if this persists not too long, what you'll see is some rebound of appreciation of everything we lost during this period that we knew before and we now we can recover. Um, this, the pandemic, unlike the Great Depression, is very interesting because there are industries that completely got hit, um, like travel and tourism and entertainment to some extent. And there are industries that did not get hit at all. And so uh, that dynamic is not one we knew before from uh, periods of depression. And if, the, if this period is not long enough, um, 
then that buoyancy afforded by the stable parts sectors of business is going to prevent, I think, long lasting um, psychological effects. Other than the fact that, you know, I have an 18 year old about to go to college, um, most of her generation grew up thinking that life is, um, is only great. Um, many of them have traveled, seen developing countries, but that seemed like someone else's problem. And someone else's problems disappear very quickly. Um, this is the first day of experience a threat. And um, I think that will have some lasting impressions. Uh, but again, if the period's not too long, it's probably not gonna leave big marks like you and I saw with our grandparents um, and parents to some extent. If this period is long, if it takes two, three years until there's a vaccine and if everybody essentially will end up sadly knowing a close one who suffered greatly from this disease, that's gonna create a, a generation that is much um, more uh, occupied with mortality salience. And um, that could both spur a generation that is more innovative and works hard to avoid future problems like that, but it could also um, hinder uh, innovation and creativity with um, negative mental states. Um, since I tend to take the optimistic side, my guess is that this um, pandemic will not last too long and the, the lasting and remaining impressions of ours and the next generation will contribute to a better readiness for things like that in the future. We will demand our governments and politicians do what's necessary, um, but probably will not get as extreme long lasting responses as the Great Depression. Maybe if I could join you in optimism, maybe one of the hopes that we could have is that um, as, a, as a global world, we're all in this together and that we need innovation and creativity and science to help us tackle these kinds of challenges and that there's no faster way than through that collaboration and reliance on that integration. Yeah, and you know that um, some of the companies I work with are very global and you can, you can easily tell that that is a, in this day and age, the ability to collaborate globally is a huge asset. I think this pandemic has seen the largest um, network of scientists working together globally towards one outcome. Um, so there are a lot of very positive effects there. Um, again, the translation between the science and what science can achieve and policymakers using those um, achievements still needs a lot of work. Well, um, maybe the pandemic took away our ability to meet in person. It took away our ability to fly. It took away our ability to even stand six feet from one another. But it doesn't seem that the pandemic has stopped our desire and our need and our effort to collaborate, to come together. Uh, to hopefully develop those solutions that are required. So thank you so much for thank you for your time um, and your insights were absolutely fantastic, very thought provoking. I look forward so much to to sharing this content and hearing how other people react to your wonderful insights. Thank you so much. Those were very thought provoking questions. Um, <laughs> always happy to chat, as I said. All right. Thanks so much. Okay. Stay well. Okay. You too. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye.